Good afternoon, everyone. Good evening to some. I'm Jane Dixon Weber, the Director of Education and Support Services at the National Fragile X Foundation. I would like to welcome you to today's webinar, Medication for Individuals Living with Fragile X Syndrome. Dr. Craig Erickson is our presenter. Before we begin, I want to tell you that these webinars are made possible by your donations. Thank you for your ongoing support. We have about a 10 to 15 minute presentation um, this afternoon, evening, and then we'll take questions for the remainder of the hour. And we're going to try something different this time. So we're going to alternate between me reading questions and um, you getting to ask your own question. So I think you'll be able to see uh, on your screen where you can raise your hand. So we'll let you know when it's open for questions and you can raise your hand and I'll call on you. Please keep it to one question per person. Now, I would like to introduce Dr. Craig Erickson. He's the director of the Fragile X Research and Treatment Center and associate professor of child and adolescent psychiatry at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. He provides clinical care for persons of all ages um, who have Fragile X syndrome. His research focuses on targeted treatment development in Fragile X syndrome including work to develop biomarkers to use in Fragile X targeted treatment studies. For the fifth time in as many years, welcome Dr. Erickson. Thank you so much, uh, Jane, R really appreciate it. And uh, I was trying to find my uh, picture of my family with the Fragile X pumpkin. I may, I may find that later, but uh, we, we really enjoyed that opportunity. So. You know, I, I love doing this, very excited about it. My slides are gonna be brief and I'm going to really review new research that we have going on in Cincinnati and then really we'll devote uh, the bulk of our time to take uh, questions from anyone. So, uh, you know, with no further ado, I just wanna give a little update on what we're doing in Cincinnati. And Cincinnati is also home to the July 2018 International Fragile X meeting. We're super excited about partnering and really working with our uh, family organization in the area. And we hope as many people can come as possible and really have a great time. And we're really honored for Cincinnati to be the location for what I really think is, is the best, uh, best meeting in the world that, that I love to go to and take my family to. So quickly, what are we doing in Fragile X? So we always have a sense of forward momentum. One thing that's key in new medication and treatment development is outcome measure development. So I'm working with our psychologist, Dr. Rebecca Schaefer, to work on a new observational measure of social and communication change. So it's the idea that we want to be able to videotape interactions and score them in a standard way and uh, in the younger age range, so as we bring new treatments, even younger, we can really detect change. We don't have to worry about placebo effect. So we're enrolling folks in this site. Uh, UC Davis is going to be participating also, and we're really trying to have a better outcome measure. So, you know, that's supporting new treatment by measuring outcome. It's very interesting. And for anything at our center, if people are interested, our email address is at the bottom, fragilex at cchmc.org. Um, we're doing parent behavior training. So this is the idea that I talk a lot about medications, but we're big believers in uh, therapy interventions. And we have a lot of folks in behavioral psychology and Dr. Schaefer's our leader at the Fragile X Center. And we're really working with parents of children with Fragile X to work on behavioral concerns that they may have uh, with their child. And it really uses information kind of from the autism world, but it's designed to be really specific to Fragile X. We've had a lot of local family input when we do this behavior training, and it's really trying to personalize behavioral intervention to Fragile X. Um, so we're not, you know, just using what people use in autism and that it's tailored. So that's a research project on improving kind of non-drug behavioral interventions. Then I'm working with Dr. Kelly Dominic, who, who I mentor, who's a, a newer physician in our group. Um, she's an academic child psychiatrist and also has a, you know, a PhD where she did a lot of brain imaging. But we're doing work with uh, MRI studies in babies and infants uh, with Fragile X and, and young toddlers um, to really see can we find predictors with imaging that help us understand later in life who may develop autism, who may not, and um, 
This is, you know, a really, really important study. It's, you know, hard to find the youngest individuals with Fragile X. There, it's an understudied population, but we think we're really on to understanding predictors that then allow us to better design the earliest of treatments. And, um, you know, like all of our stuff, it's, it's pretty much, you know, freely, freely offered. We offer travel support. MRI is a little bit challenging, but um, we find a lot of, you know, babies and infants are able to do it, and we give them a lot of prep materials. So people can return if it doesn't work, and we kind of try and try again. There's no sedation or drugging of the child involved, which is really the safe way to do it. This is very interesting, and this is medication-related, some medications that people may want to ask questions about. But this is looking at single doses of acamprosate, minocycline, and lovastatin. All medicines studied as targeted treatments in Fragile X. And it's, what it does is it enables you to get each of these drugs one dose or placebo, so four different dose conditions. And we study what effect that dose has on your brain. And then we can sort of report back on if we see normalization of abnormal brain activation. So we do EEG that studies brain electrical activity. We do eye tracking, like where people look. And um, we do that pre and post testing. We also do blood tests where we see if blood proteins change with treatment. And then at the end of the study, we're able to unblind things a few weeks after the study, and we have kind of separate physicians, not myself, so I'm not biased in the analysis, but other physicians in my group provide feedback to the families of, hey, your child, when they got this drug, it had that effect on their brain. And then those kind of patterns can help predict which of these medicines as examples may be better for an individual. So again, it's really how do we personalize medication use by using quantitative equipment, this time EEG, which looks at brain electrical activity, to really match medications to individuals. And it's for 15 to 55-year-olds with Fragile X. And there's a lot of um, support available for travel in for this one, but it is a few visits. Again, it's a single dose each time, really looking at what impact it's having. Then, um, you know, finally, uh, Ernie Petipati, who's another physician that I've, I've trained and worked with extensively in our Fragile X Center, is using a new technology called transcranial magnetic stimulation to study brain connectivity and activation patterns in Fragile X. And it's really a non-invasive uh, magnetic uh, means to use magnetic pulses to study brain function. And it's, it's highly novel. It's been used in autism and ADHD and depression. Um, and we're using it in Fragile X. And Ernie has a, a, a grant from the National Institutes of Health to bring it into Fragile X. And we can really, you know, in, uh, really down to age 8 up to 55, we can do the technique. We can also do it with carriers, individuals with the full mutation. And it's, um, you know, a, a really kind of novel, novel intervention. So I just had some, you know, one of those weird computer virus pop-up things come up, and I cleared it. So, um, you know, during TMS, transcranial magnetic simulation, individuals just sit there. This pulse is delivered, and there's something that measures the impact. So really, it's low risk. It's a, a magnetic coil, and then we have a sensor on the finger that kind of detects uh, the, the change through through connections with your muscles. So. A lot of novel stuff going on in Cincinnati. Uh, we have a lot of sense of forward momentum. You know, I think, you know, people talk about, you know, treatment development in Fragile Axe, and we've had studies that haven't gone completely as we wanted them to, but we really think we're on the dawn of improving study design and understanding brain function better. So then when we study a new medication or even a new therapy, we know right away for an individual with Fragile X, is it making a positive difference? And a lot of our work is aligned that way, and, and we're, we're really excited about it. So without that, that's enough of, of uh, what we have going on that's new, and I'm ready to take questions. I love doing this every year, and, and uh, fire away. Okay. Well, we're waiting for a question to come in or someone to raise their hand. Can everyone see that? Um, could you talk to us a little bit about uh, CBD and CBD oil and yes. what's going on there? Yeah, so um, C CBD oil 
is really um, not regulated by the FDA. It, it really kind of comes in that uh, sort of nutraceuticals or uh, the way kind of vitamins and supplements get to individuals. And you can buy uh, CBD oil products, for this ex ex uh, example, on Amazon.com. Um, I've had a lot of families ask and have trialed CBD oil. Um, I have to say I've not heard negative reports. I've also not heard uniform uh, positive reports or seen big breakthroughs. But the truth is, um, nothing related to uh, CBD or really cannabinoids or cannabis or marijuana products have been systematically studied in Fragile X in a placebo-controlled setting. And um, a lot of our, our listeners and viewers may have heard about, you know, this report from the uh, Zenerba Pharmaceuticals out of Australia uh, that talk about, you know, a cannabinoid-related uh, medication that is uh, an open label treatment and had a really positive result. And I think that while that is exciting, it really just is justification to do more rigorous study. So whether it's CBD oil or a Zenerba product or another cannabinoid related product, we just really need to do a placebo controlled study. And uh, the same way that we studied a Campersate open label and we had really good early results, then we did a placebo controlled study, we're almost done with that now, we don't know the results yet. That's really what we want to see from things like CBD oil and, and related uh, molecules. So I think we're, we're probably uh, near that in the field, I hope in the next year or so, that we can really test these hypotheses that whether it's CBD oil or something related to cannabinoid receptors, you know, what does that do in Fragile X? So, and, and the excitement is palpable, and I get that, but um, we, we still really, the, the jury's out in a scientific sense, we have to see. Now, to that end, I don't dissuade families from trialing CBD oil that they can buy um, uh, on the internet, so I, I think that that's okay. I don't, I don't see harm in it, but I'm also not convinced uh, really one way or another on positive benefits, and, and I think that's really the take of a lot of us in the field right now. Great. Thank you. Um, Kevin, we're going to uh, take a question from you. Uh, you can talk. Uh, your mic is open. Hi, uh, Dr. Harrison. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Uh, thanks for taking my um, question. Um, I have a 26-year-old male son, Fragile X. Mosaic. Mosaic. Um, he's overweight, and for years he's had a really high salt craving. Like, he just can't get enough of it. And... Um, so we took him to the doctors recently, thinking that he had a um, hyponatremia. But I guess his vasopressins, I think it was called, his um, ADH hormone was fine. Um, but he was, he had low sugar letter. He was um, low sugar level. He was at 69. Um, so we gave him, so now we're going to go see a nutritionist to get him, um, try to get him to lose weight. But um, I was wondering if you've seen anything with uh, any Fragile X patients with high, really high salt cravings. No, not, not specifically with uh, high salt cravings. That's not something I've heard. Hyponatremia, you know, is a low sodium really in your system. There are some medications that rarely can induce that. The most common we see is a medication called... Uh, Trileptal or oxcarbazepine, which is an anti-epileptic that sometimes is used for behavior. Um, you know, while you start, you started. To, you said you were. You said glucose was low, like hypoglycemia. Is that right? Sixty-seven. Yes, he was at uh, sixty-seven at the time that he got his blood drawn, and he had just eaten like an hour before that. Um, so he's been getting a lot of uh, aggression, yeah. like okay. every every couple times a day, he would get really bad aggression. He would get flushed in the face sweat a lot, um, bite his hand, and then five minutes later, ten minutes later, he's laughing and giggling like nothing happened. Um, he is on Topamax right now. We're trying to wean him off of that. So and his sodium levels were normal. 
Sodium is normal. That's good. Is he take any other medications? Like, does he take metformin or any any other potential different behavioral medicines? He's on um, Topamax and Effexor. And Topamax and Effexor. Um, yeah. Top Topamax can definitely reduce appetite um, and sometimes causes weight loss. It doesn't really affect uh, you know, salt that much uh, in, a, in a known way. It seems to me like if you had a low fasting glucose, it would definitely be worth repeating to see if it's consistent and then just work up, you know, with the primary care physician uh, and, and then potentially refer to a specialist this hypo, hypoglycemia because, it, you know, you, you could have a situation where if you're glycemic, you know, values are fluctuating in abnormal ways that that would be something that could provoke behavior, I think. So it, it seems like it's worth worth looking into. Hypoglycemia like that is not really a known Fragile X-associated uh, feature, but it certainly had, can potentially happen for, for reasons that aren't understood unless you, you know, do further workup. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, here's a question on metformin. I'm interested in metformin for my son, but his developmental pediatrician hasn't heard of its use in Fragile X. Can you point out metformin studies or papers that we can send our doctor's way? Well, um, you know, first first of all, I can, I'm, I'm happy to forward to Jane to distribute, you know, some specific references because they're there are uh, metformin, they're um, still open label uh, reports in, in Fragile X of some positive effects. Um, but, you know, in some ways, I think the Fragile X metformin study, we're very hopeful about it. Like with cannabinoids, we need to do controlled studies. But there is really a rich literature of utilizing metformin broadly in neurodevelopmental disorders including recent studies in autism, including placebo-controlled studies. And, and my group published a long-term metformin treatment study in, in autism involving a large number of individuals that show that the medication is really quite well tolerated in folks with developmental disability, including in children. And from a weight perspective, can be very useful to blunt weight gain associated with other medicines like a ripiprazole or risperidone. So, um, you know, I, I'm happy to, to provide those references that show it's safe and get the reference for Fragile X. The um, one thing to watch for with metformin is like a loosening of bowel movements or an upset stomach in some individuals. It can be a little bit of a large pill to swallow. You can crush it. Sometimes it doesn't taste great, though. And there's a liquid formulation called Ryomet, but at least here in the Midwestern United States, we've had some supply issues with not consistently being able to have families get the uh, liquid metformin. But I'm happy to assist with that and provide those references because I think there's good justification that it's well tolerated broadly and um, you know is, is worth a shot even though we don't really know definitively yet what it would do. If your child's had weight gain with other medications I think it's a no-brainer in our clinic but just as a pure Fragile X treatment for everyone I think that's what we need to figure out. And so in that information you send me will it talk about dosages and... Yeah, yeah I'll, I mean I'll, I'll say dosages on the, on the call right now. I mean uh, you know, target full dosing is 1,000 milligrams twice a day. And I, I would say, you know, once you're really kind of to a, about age 12 or so, maybe even 10 to 12, we'll go up to 1,000 twice a day. Um, if you're young, such as maybe even, you know, under age 8, kind of in the, you know, uh, preschool through second grade age range, we maybe start at about 250 milligrams and then go up 250 milligrams at a time. If you're older, if you're already kind of 9, 10 years of age, we start about 500 milligrams, and then we go up to 500 milligrams twice a day towards, again, that maximum dosing. It's dosed at meal times, breakfast, and dinner, and it probably has a bit of a dual effect. 
of both reducing um, excessive appetite and having a positive effect on metabolism where you, you just don't kind of, uh, you know, pack on uh, the excess calories and, and you're able to, you know, burn through things better. So, yeah, I mean, I, uh, I'm, I'm happy to correspond to with uh, any local providers that, that seek guidance on metformin dosing because I have a lot of experience with it in Fragile X and in neurodevelopmental disorders broadly. So, you know, you know to, to that end, this Fragile X at cchmc.org, you know, you, you can email that with a question about metformin dosing or you can give that address to any uh, local medical provider. And if they if they have a question or something specific, you know my staff will get it on to me and and I'll respond right back uh, with that answer. I mean I, I I get queries from all over the place, so ha happy to do that. That email address at the bottom here works works for those kind of questions too. Great. Now on something like that, do you need blood work? You know that's uh we, you know 10 15 years ago we were uh, there there was some literature about uh, high potential high lactic acid and lactic acidosis, um, it really hasn't borne out to be a significant issue in our, our, um, in our use in neurodevelopmental disorders. We're not formally getting uh, what I would say regular metformin safety labs, but I would say this, for individuals that are overweight and have gained a lot of weight on other medicines that then we're treating with metformin, those individuals, by virtue of weight gain and stuff, we do get like lipid panels, cholesterol panels, uh, glucose levels, hemoglobin A1C, which is a long-term measure of glucose, <clears throat> and we get kind of liver and kidney function. So not really necessarily specific to metformin, but if you do have an obesity issue secondary to other meds causing weight gain, then yes, we, we do get safety labs just to be sure there are not any complications from being overweight. Great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna let, we have another live question and it's from Melba. Melba, you can ask your question now. Well, she must have stepped away. Um, how about Corinne? Corinne, um, you're, you can ask your question now. Corinne, can you hear me? Okay, they must have stepped away for a minute. I've got another written question that came in. Um, I'll try again uh, in just a minute. For someone who did well on STX209, would you A, recommend trying regular baclofen, and B, if so, what dosing schedule? We're looking at a 15-year-old male with Fragile X syndrome at 165 pounds. Okay, 165 pounds. So, um, you know, uh, first of all, uh, we've had a lot of folks in this STX 209 boat and have tried a lot of conversions to generic uh, baclofen and um, have not had uh, what I would call overwhelmingly positive results, unfortunately. And um, hard, hard to say why. I, I still think it's certainly uh, worth a try per se in, um, in, look, in looking into it. But, um, you know, as far as dosing in that uh, age range and size, I think it's, um, you know, we would probably start at uh, five milligram dosing twice a day, go up to about uh, 10 twice a day, maybe to 15. If we're getting any sedation or concerns, we spread the dosing and uh, probably get up to about 30 a day. Um, one thing you could do is if you knew your STX-209 dose from before, you can kind of do a two-to-one conversion and about twice that is what your dose would be in generic baclofen. So that, that's something, um, you know, if you know that, that can be uh, pretty, pretty helpful. So. This is my shameless uh, Fragile X pumpkin picture with my children. I don't know if you can even still see my screen, but uh, we, we enjoy carving the X. That's a great picture, and I love the X. Yeah, yeah, I, uh, it, it did pretty well. It was pretty cool, and it was glowing, too, but the pictures were, 
the pictures weren't as good. So it's definitely a conversation pumpkin where people, you know, kind of ask what it's about and you can talk to them about it, which is nice. Nice. All right, let's try another live question. How about Carol? You're unmuted now. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, my question is in regards to my daughter. Uh, she's 15. She has fragile X and also a diagnosis of autism. She is not on any medication at the moment. Uh, she's had some minor behavioral issues through the years, but they've been managed through behavioral plans. Um, and we really were reluctant to put her on any medication because it was being managed and she was gaining great strides. Um, but at the moment, she is really, she's had a lot of regression. She was in the wrong place in school and she's had some setbacks and her behaviors are now really, really posing a problem for her moving forward. And uh, so we are actually planning on going to one of the fragile, local fragile X clinics in a couple of weeks. But uh, I was just curious if there are some general medications that are used for fragile X, for those with fragile X with these kinds of behavioral issues, like she does a lot of hitting and crying and throwing herself to the floor, those kind of things. So, you know, for the symptom cluster that the um, FDA has always termed irritability, which is kind of like severe tantrums, aggression, and self-injury, like if, if your daughter's getting to the point of hitting or, you know, uh, doing anything to really hurt herself or if the tantrums are pretty severe and regular um, and there's a lot of kind of affective or mood sort of up and down, getting real upset, is, is that kind of what we're talking about? Yeah, I, I mean, it, she, it's not so much she doesn't really hurt herself. It's more okay. of uh, people generally, more teachers, anyone who's putting heavy demands on her, doing yeah. stuff that, you know, she doesn't want to okay. do, or sure. she just gets very frustrated, uh, yeah. and it's just, it seems to be getting worse and worse, and uh, it, behavioral plans are not doing what needs to be done at this point. Gotcha. Well, it sounds like you're doing everything right, which is really take all the behavioral measures, do what you can, and then this age range that she's in, is really the highest incidence we see for, you know, kind of the irritability, aggression, tantrum. Some people self-injure, some can get aggressive towards others. It's kind of a mix. And, um, you know, there, there, there's some thought, you know, if you think it's really purely anxiety driving it, that's one thing. But, you know, I, I think as you describe it, and in my experience, once we see that degree of behavior, the best medication options are really the FDA approved drugs to treat irritability and aggression in autism that have been studied in Fragile X. And the, the only one really that's been systematically studied is we studied aripiprazole or Abilify. Uh, gosh, it's been, uh, you know, I start to feel like I'm old. I, I feel like it was 10, 12 years ago we published that paper. But Abilify works really well. And as someone who is not, you know, really required medication and is, as you said, you know, behavioral strategies and things have worked, you may be able to get by on a, on a pretty low dose, but that would be your best evidence-based option. And we would probably start dosing at two milligrams, even in the evening, and it lasts kind of 24 hours. And then we would, you know, ratchet up as needed to two to four to five. Probably the target dose range would be five to 15 but you may get by on quite a low dose. We would just need to see. Um, we, we've seen about three quarters of individuals with a pretty positive Abilify response that have those exact behavioral concerns. There is some risk of weight gain with the medicine though. It's certainly not everyone, but it does happen um, in, a, in a kind of a strong minority of individuals. Um, that I think would be the clear first direction to go. Um, you know, I, I think classically in adolescence, that's really our highest risk period. Sometimes it's earlier, sometimes it's later. But, you know, there's good evidence that even even among females, you know, a solid quarter to a third and, and more than that, males, you know, have unfortunately some of these behavioral issues. But luckily, I think they're they're relatively pretty treatable. But that's that's where we would start. 
Okay, thank you. We have another question. What do you recommend for controlling emotional outbursts that the teenager feels coming only moments before violent behavior, but he cannot control himself? Per per him, he is he is asking the doctor for help. You know that's that's very very interesting because it you know has some parallels to the prior question. I guess the difference being there's like this sense of emotion kind of building up and then sort of you know the the, the cork pops off the bottle and you have an outburst but I, I really think the same medication or piperazole could be really useful now the one caveat I would have is if we do think there's a real anxiety provoking thing like we have a situation where you know a lot of people being around or it's loud or or those kind of things and somebody's kind of getting overwhelmed and, and then they have this kind of emotional overload and, and then they get aggressive. If, if we think we understand, you know, um, prior events and feel it's anxiety related, sometimes you can go potentially at anxiety first with like a sertraline Zoloft or citalopram Celexa. But if we, if we can't really appreciate that very well, I, I really think the Abilify would be the, the same direction I would go. It's, you know, it's a very good mood stabilizer. It's a good treatment of aggression, and it also just kind of generally helps mood and has an FDA approval for treatment-resistant depression. I'm not saying this is depression, but I am saying that it really kind of helps stabilize sort of mood states and, and emotional dysregulation. So with Abilify, um, can you give us an idea on dosages that you're looking at? Yeah, so, um, you know, generally we dose in about a 5 to 20 range across broad ages. It's available in a liquid, 1 milligram per 1 milliliter. It's available in 2, 5, 10, 15, 20 milligram pills. Um, and it's available in a dissolving tab at similar milligrams. Um, in some of our youngest guys, if we're having some pretty significant aggression, even in 4, 5, 6 years of age, in that range, sometimes we'll even start a milligram and go a milligram at a time very gingerly. Um, like I said earlier, if we have folks that haven't really required medication and they're, you know, 15, 16, 20, 25, 30 years of age, sometimes even two milligrams really does it. And the goal is always a minimal effective dose. So we'll start at either two or two and a half milligrams, go up and uh, two and a half milligram increments if we're using five milligram pills and we kind of adjust every week or two because you know you know relatively quickly if it's helping it's not the kind of medicine that takes weeks and weeks to know but you do have to watch for the weight gain you have to watch for a rare risk of abnormal movements like a muscle twitching jerking there's a rare risk of something called akathisia which is like a constant need to be in motion and that one can be hard to figure out because sometimes when people are anxious, they're moving around a lot. But that's kind of like you really can't sit still at all, and you could before. It's rare, but you got to watch for it. But again, you know, despite all those caveats and concerns across the broad spectrum of individuals with fragile X, we get pretty good response. But that doesn't mean it works for everyone. But um, that that's pretty much how we dose it and, and utilize it and. To be frank, I, I tried to work with the National Institutes of Health and the government to do placebo-controlled Abilify studies in Fragile X, and we could just never get traction because the argument given was, well, it's approved in autism, so that's close enough. And I think that's unfortunate, and I don't think we're probably going to be able to you know, do those studies, at least in the near term, but we still know it has a pretty solid track record, and it's widely used in Fragile X. And, is our first choice with risperidone or risperdal being our second choice. Okay, let's try another live question. Uh, Allison, I am, uh, you are now, oops, muted by, I can't get, so David, I can't get Allison to unmute. Let me say. Let's try this again. Well, while I'm working on that, let's take another question on, uh, this is kind of a, we're getting kind of a similar, do you have a recommendation for medication for an adult male with fragile X for general calming 
and avoiding outbursts. Recently got off Paxil and Risperidone, which was not that helpful. Well, definitely, if hadn't been on aripiprazole or Abilify, we would go in that direction. From a pure anxiety standpoint, and I assume you know that's what the uh, that's what the Paxil was for. Uh, we we're not big Paxil users because of it has its own weight gain risks. Um, much more uh, likely to use sertraline, Zoloft, or citalopram, Celexa. Those are really the top two anxiety medicines. So I could definitely see kind of rebuilding a regimen of one of those two. SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors for anxiety, either sertraline or citalopram. And then I would definitely, if you hadn't been on it before, take aripiprazole uh, for the more significant aggression and agitation. Now, if anxiety is more the primary with more limited aggression, it may be worth just trying to treat anxiety with citalopram or sertraline first and then fade in the aripiprazole. If aggression is a pretty prominent feature, if it's pretty regular and somewhat severe, I think you're really going to have to get the aripiprazole going and then see how much kind of anxiety and other things are left. Okay. Um, just a quick follow-up on the metformin, because um, we, we basically just talked about using it. But So um, can you give us a little information, like what is metformin used for? What is the hope to gain from it? Well, first of all, you know, it's really FDA approved to treat type 2 diabetes primarily. And so the first thing, you know, you get is you get fear. My kid, my, my child, whether they're an adult or a, a younger child, you know, they don't have type 2 diabetes. And, and the answer to that is, yeah, that's correct. But there's still a safety profile where it can be used. So we don't have to be worried that it's going to cause like their sugar to tank or those kind of issues. Um, it's pretty well established that it's effective or uh, at least effective some of the time that it's worth trying for weight gain associated with other medicines. But the hope in Fragile X is, and, and we have some partners around the country that we're trying to uh, do a trial of it in a placebo-controlled way, the hope is it may have a positive <clears throat> really brain effect on brain activity where it could potentially promote learning and potentially reduce core anxiety um, and, and uh, specific to Fragile X because there's positive studies in animal models and there's, you know, at least one initial positive report in humans with Fragile X that's not placebo controlled. So, you know, we hope it can be a Fragile X targeted treatment. Um, it reduces activation of some molecular signaling that we know is overactive in Fragile X. So I think that's exciting. But we, we just don't know. And, um, you know, I'd, I'd be ecstatic if by next year in the United States we were able to roll out a placebo-controlled metformin study uh, because we don't know what its Fragile X-specific effects are, are really going to be. We know that it's pretty good for weight gain associated with other medicines, and that's a great use in Fragile X. That's a great use in um, autism and, and other developmental disorders. But... You know, if, if it does have this Fragile X specific result, we're going to have to figure that out in a, in a multi-site trial. Great. Um, thank you. So let's try, another, let's try another live question. Kim, uh, you've been holding for a while. Your mic is now unmuted. Hi, it's Kim from Toronto. Um, I have a son who's 19 years old who is on both Abilify and Fluvoxamine. And I just wanted to get your comments about him remaining on fluvoxamine. I understand um, that the two may be uh, working together in a positive way, and I just wanted to understand that more. Yeah, so, you know, fluvoxamine is a, a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, uh, kind of FDA-approved anxiety and obsessive compulsive disorder medication. Um, among that class of drugs, which also includes fluoxetine, Prozac, sertraline, Zoloft, citalopram, Celexa, paroxetine, Paxil, Lexapro, which is escitalopram. <clears throat> There's a lot of them that are quite similar. <clears throat> Fluvoxamine has a lot of drug-drug interactions. So, um, you know, you have to be aware of that. Uh, I'm going to run a quick, because I, I keep a program with me that just does quick cross-referencing of 
uh, drug cross metabolism, and I'll, I'll give you an answer specific to Abilify. Um, but you know, ostensibly, the fluvoxamine would provide uh, reduced anxiety, and Abilify would help with more significant kind of uh, agitation, aggression, you know, potentially severe tantrums, that kind of stuff. So I, I certainly think there can be a um, logic in using both of them. You do need to be careful with the Luvox if you're, you know, if you add a bunch of other medications to it because it does impact the metabolism of a, of a number of, uh, of different drugs. And um, so that, that's really, really a key thing. Yeah, I didn't think there were. There are no specific Luvox, Abilify interaction problems. But, you know, even, even um, some antibiotics and some other medicines, Luvox, um, cross reacts to so you would always want any prescriber to know that your child was taking that. Um, what's the Luvox dose, the fluvoxamine dose? Um, it's uh, 50 milligrams and he's on 4 milligrams of Abilify. Is and it he's, he's 19 and with the Abilify he gained probably about 35 pounds so he's up around 180. So a couple of things. If that's 50 milligrams of Luvox one time a day, um, is that is that what it is? Yes, they're both uh, in the evening. Okay, so that's a really low dose of Luvox, and unless it is Luvox extended release, it's really a medicine we do twice a day because it doesn't really have kind of um, – you know, that long of an ability to stick in your system in a consistent way. So I just kind of throw that out there. Um, you know, if you want to get a, a good anxiolytic effect in that age range with that size of an individual, you know, classically we're thinking 150, 200, <clears throat> 300 milligrams of fluvoxamine. So I think that's one of those situations where you know, you don't want to take more than you need, but if you're hanging on something, um, you might as well want to see if you can get more benefit if you haven't probed that. The Abilify dose is quite low. I mean, that weight gain is definitely really concerning. So if I had somebody with that level of weight gain with Abilify, I would be asking the questions, do we think it's really helped? And if we do and we want to continue, I think it's a perfect example for a consideration of a metformin add-on to try to blunt, uh, blunt that risk. Um, so a couple of things there. On the fluvoxamine, it's really on the low side, so I think I'd kind of say, hey, you know, do we want to get more out of it? I'm a big sort of use it or lose it uh, pharmacology person. You know, if you're on something, let's have a sense if it's helping. If it's not, let's get it to a good effective dose range before we give up on it. If something is helping but having a negative effect, what are we going to do about that? Because um, otherwise you can kind of get stuck. And so you don't want to get stuck on subtherapeutic Luvox if it has more potential benefit. Um, and at the same way, I think you got to answer that Abilify concern. You know, I took him off Abilify because I was concerned. And... Um, it was so powerful what a difference Abilify was making in terms of his behavior. Well, so we, we had to put him back on it. So the weight gain to me was, you know, it, it, it was the lesser of the two evils. That We hear that a lot. That's why we've really been using the metformin add-ons. I'd also say this. Um, the uh, weight gain with the Abilify does not really tend to be too dose-dependent. So if the Luvox is kind of <clears throat> hanging there, we're not really sure what, you know, your, your, um, your, your child would probably be better off, you know, even if they had to take a tad more Abilify and you could get rid of the Luvox from an overall kind of drug exposure, um, you know, perspective. Now that's assuming anxiety is not kind of terribly out of control because if you really have palpable anxiety, I would try to use the Luvox to more effect, but the way it's sitting there at 50, that's it's on the low end, and like I said, dose one time a day is is a, is a little unusual. Um, 
Let's, um, I have another question I'd like to uh, move on to. Um, are there any medications to help our 28-year-old, uh, uh, let's see, I think it's a young man, uh, with Fragilex go to sleep quicker? Meds provided by the doctor in the past caused hallucinations. We're currently giving him melatonin and Benadryl. And uh, let's see, I think he's got one more. He added something else to that. Um, he's not on any other meds. He's active days, works, exercises, just a hard time getting him quiet to go to sleep. But he sleeps all night once he's asleep. So it, anything to get him to go to sleep? Yeah, so I have a uh, sort of an algorithm in my head for sleep medicines. And they start with where they already are, which doesn't seem to be effective, but certainly is safe. Melatonin, Benadryl. If those aren't working, we go with uh, trazodone, then clonidine. Trazodone is an old antidepressant that at lower dosing than used to treat depression can be a quite safe sleep med. We use it across childhood and adulthood in Fragile X and related disorders. Typically, we can start trazodone as low as 25, <clears throat> go up in 25 milligram increments. It can be safely taken really up to two or 300 at night. Um, if we fail trazodone, we go to clonidine. Clonidine is an old... Uh, Blood pressure medicines also used to treat ADHD. We start um, in that age range with 0.1 milligram, go up in 0.1 milligram increments to about 0.3 as kind of a higher end. If we fail clonidine and trazodone, then I go with low dose of what's called mirtazapine or Remeron, which is actually an anxiety and mood medicine. But in low doses, it can be really good for sleep and it's probably a little bit safer than the next options I'll describe. Uh, the next options are some of the classic prescription um, benzodiazepine derivatives, um, we use temazepam, Restoril, and sometimes we use Ambien. So without knowing specifically kind of what caused the nightmares, you know, I'm sure it was probably maybe well with something on my list, but we just kind of go down that pecking order and we just kind of go down until we find something and the vast majority of the time we can stop in kind of the trazodone or clonidine world before we have to get to kind of the, the heavier hitters. Okay. Um, what are the best treatments for OCD behaviors with Fragile X syndrome? You know, I think we try to give a go with uh, FDA approved kind of ang anxiety and OCD medicines and, you know, sertraline or Zoloft's got a lot of OCD data behind it. It has a lot of Fragile X data. So for very repetitive fixations, you know, we go in that direction. Often when we're really calling stuff OCD because it's <clears throat> very compulsive and obsessional, higher dosing is really required. So for sertraline, you know, that's really trying to get up to probably at least 100, more likely 200 milligrams a day and holding steady. What you don't want to do for OCD phenomena is take a anxiety medicine like a Zoloft or Prozac or citalopram, Selexa, or Lexapro, which is s -citalopram. you don't want to low dose it because, you know, I think the evidence really shows that if you're really getting that fixated, lower dosing, sometimes lower dosing can help a bit with anxiety, but for more kind of severe OCD-like phenomena, I think we, we really got to dose it to a, to a pretty strong effect, and you don't want to undershoot because you won't, you won't get to where you need to be. Okay, let's try another live question. Melba, do you have a, a question? Okay, um, you know what, she actually typed her question in. Our son is 35 years old and still suffers from severe anxiety. He takes Alpraz... I don't even know how to say all these. Alprazolam. Alprazolam. That's Xanax. Okay, and sertraline. We would like to try the CBD oil. Does he need to be off any of these meds before we try that oil? Uh, well, the, the short answer is no. Um, my editorial comment is alprazolam is a tricky drug. It's a benzodiazepine, so it is approved to treat anxiety, but it has a really short half-life. And um, there's now alprazolam extended release, but it's my least favorite anxiety medicine in that class because it kind of zips in and out of your system 
which has some risk of yo-yoing people. Um, th this is not fully applicable, but it kind of relates to that in and out of your system quick. Alprazolam is really the most commonly abused benzodiazepine for that reason. So I'm not saying no one with Fragile X should take Alprazolam, but I think it's definitely less preferred than medications in the class such as Clonazepam that have a lot longer half-life and are more kind of a, a little bit gradual and they don't kind of hit you like a ton of bricks and then come off. Because the problem with the Alprazolam is it does that, but then when you take it over time, 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 you get really used to it. Um, but no, the short, the short answer is I'm not worried about CBD oil with those, but I do, I do have a little Alprazolam concern, and typically I would counsel people on longer-acting alternatives that may be a little uh, more effective and, and better tolerated long-term. Okay. Um. Let's, let's see. I've got a question from, well, let's see if it opens up. Um, I think it's Miss Shaw. Are you still on the line? Is it Devana? Yes. Okay. Uh, we, we can hear you. Yes. Um, actually, I have 11 years old full, full mutation fragile X. And he's on Zola 50 milligram, um, Abilify 4 milligram, and we recently started Focaline uh, for uh, 10 milligram. So my question is, um, Abilify works wonderful, um, and uh, we are giving him from uh, last four years, but um, he's not gaining any weight. Uh, he's currently around 89 pounds, um, but I heard like all the side effects and stuff. So is it safe? to give him and when I can see the side effect uh, after how many years I use that. And um, another quite, another thing that I have is the, his behavior. He's very aggressive and um, very um, um, behavioral outbursts and everything. Uh, so we started focusing with the Zoloft, so, but we don't see the good improvement on that. So it's uh, just any other medication. So here's my thoughts on that. You kind of have the classic combo of a medication for kind of tantruming, irritability, agitation, Abilify. If you're not gaining significant weight on it, it's not like the weight gain is going to come out of nowhere later. I think you're pretty much good and in a good place with that. The sertraline or the Zoloft, a little bit on the lower side. I think 50 is still a pretty solid dose. You know, the Focalin, in, is it Focalin extended release or just immediate release Focalin? Uh, it's just not the extended because he can't swallow the medication. So oh, he's, okay. yeah. So the thing with the Focalin is you kind of know right away if, it, if it's good or if it's bad, you know. And if you're not noticing anything positive, um, it's a relatively low dose. You could adjust the dose. Has he ever been on any other stimulants like Concerta or Ritalin or Adderall or Vyvanse or anything? No, no, no. We we tried uh, Tunil, Adderall. Yeah, we tried those, but it didn't work out for him. For yeah. Colleen, we we see some uh, some good stuff, but not we were what not the point that we want to see. Um, so we are not sure that maybe we can adjust the dose as you as you suggest. Yeah, is it because it's wearing off too quick, or it, it what, what's the effect like of the focalin? Um, yeah, it, it, in, the, in the beginning, like after I gave him, he, he's pretty good, but after I think three, four hours, it's kind of weighing off, and we can see some aggressive behavior tantruming again. Well, the first thing is I, I would just um, du double it up like, you know, three, four hours later. Because you're taking a you're taking a quick acting form, and mm -hmm. that, that's sort of what you're getting. So we would first say I would just do ten twice a day and start to probe that. Um, if you still get kind of a wear out effect, like you know sometimes when you're coming off of the positives of stimulants, sometimes we can see some emotionality or agitation. Mm -hmm. You can. You could even eventually do a split dosing, like uh, 10 in the morning, 5 midday, 5 after school, something like that. You don't want to take it any later than maybe 3, 4 o'clock, because then it can be hard to fall asleep. 
But mm. since you're using a short acting form, I think you want to have more of a spread throughout the day before you give up on it because you may be able to harness the positives uh, more throughout the day and not have kind of the you know snap back effect that you may be getting three four hours in going from ten to nothing. Thank you so much. And Ability, Ability 5, do you think that we can increase or we can stable with the Ability 5 or when we can see the other, like you mentioned about the muscle stone or some muscle stone or low muscle, is that uh, you can see immediately or or you can see down the road? Any you side effect on the Ability 5? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, there's still some risk down the road, but I think we tend to see it more kind of early on. If your son's been on it for a while and's not had the significant weight gain, that's a really pretty low dose. <clears throat> I think the risk of later onset um, problems is really, really low with the muscles. You still have to watch for it. But along the line, you could totally adjust that Abilify dose if you saw a breakthrough aggression or agitation. Um, you know, we would probably go five and then seven and a half and then ten. But, um, you know, if you can get by on four and just tweak the focal in more through the day, I, I think that's a first thing to do. If for no other reason than you figure out really quick what effects the focal and adjustments are having, because it's a pretty much immediate actor in and out. Okay. Um, uh, a follow-up question about the alprazolam. What should we try instead of that? Well, my first one's clonazepam or clonopin. It's a nice, long-acting uh, benzodiazepine. If you need to be in that class of anxiety medicine, uh, that's my number one choice. Because instead of kind of, you know, hitting you like a ton of bricks and leaving you, it sticks with you more longer term. It's more gradual onset, gradual offset, has the least chance of sort of, you know, getting withdrawal during the day. Uh, like you can get with Xanax or Alprazolam, which is a fast actor. Okay. Um, Craig, we're at the top of the hour. How um, do we take a couple more and then I can uh, just have people email me questions or email you directly? Let's just do two more and then um, we'll just do the email, me or you, and, and I'll be in touch that way. I'm happy to do that. Okay. Um, Let's see, we have a few here, so I'm, I'm kind of jumping around, so we try to get a variety of questions. My son just turned 18. He takes four and a half milliliters of Risperdone liquid, two milligrams of guanfacine, 10 milligrams of fluoxetine, and 1,000 milligrams of metformin twice a day. Still lots of anxiety. Any recommendations to reduce perseveration? Read me that first medicine again. Uh, ris risperidone. Risperidone. Risperidone, and the second one. Uh, guanfacine. Guanfacine. Okay. Guanfacine. And risperidone, and then the last one. Fluoxetine and metformin. How high was the fluoxetine dosing? Ten milligrams. Yeah, so that your, your money's right there. The fluoxetine's really low dose. And um, if you've had worsening or if you've had problems on higher fluoxetine dosing, you just need to change it. But that's definitely a use it or lose it kind of scenario. I mean, you got to probe, you know, 15, 20, 30, 40 milligrams of fluoxetine a few weeks at a time because it has some real potential uh, to be a good uh, medication for anxiety but it's just, it's really on the low end. So if the answer is that, you know, you're, um, you tried higher and it was no good, then you got to try a different one like a sertraline or a citalopram. But it, it may well just be that we got to go with uh, higher fluoxetine. So I, that's what I would clearly pursue for anxiety in that case. Okay. Um, here's one more. It's a family in um, South Florida. Uh, I think I can follow this. 26-year-old uh, mosaic male with autism, currently on 30 milligrams of Cymbalta, and says because that's what I was taking as a full mutation female. He is exhibiting impulsivity and aggression 
constant perseveration, and limited focusing. So far, I've not been able to find a physician in South Florida who's familiar with adults with Fragile X. We're open to exploration of new meds. We tried clonopin last weekend, and he flipped out, had some, uh, broke his TV and computer. He was on Abilify for years. Uh, it says, aren't there bad side effects to that? So it looks like we've got a 26-year-old mosaic male with autism looking for, yeah. uh, who has some aggression and, and uh, impulsivity. What would you recommend for them? Well, first of all, if we think it's a major anxiety component, you know, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but I do use Cymbalta for people that fail SSRIs like fluoxetine and sertraline and that kind of stuff. And the Cymbalta is just really low dose. <clears throat> so if you if um, they haven't probed higher, you got to give Cymbalta 60 a shot for a few weeks and see if it really helps with anxiety. If it's less anxiety and it more is really kind of explosive aggression and agitation, you could certainly return to the Abilify, the Aripiprazole. If you don't want to do that, Risperidone can be a good option, or Risperdal. There is some risk of weight gain with it. But, you know, I, I can't kind of read the mind of the individual, but, you know, if some Balt is there because they had an anxiety concern and it hasn't been higher, I think you've got to probe that because it may be that the anxiolytic effect you could get with a medicine with a pretty good safety profile, you know, could be a better option versus the Abilify and, and the Risperdals of the world. So that, that's what I would do first. And, and, and that person's welcome to, you know, email me too for more detail, but, uh, you know, all things considered, I would go, I would go Cymbalta 60. I use Cymbalta. I see a lot of adults with Fragile X. You can go as high as 120. Really, the, the goal range for the vast majority of people is kind of a minimum of 60 in my experience. So that's where I would go. Okay. Um, I think we should let you go for now. I know there, I, I know there's more questions. I'm sorry yeah. we didn't get to all of them. Um, do you want them to email me or just email you directly? Um, you know, I, I think it's fine to just email me directly and I'll respond. And then if there's, you know, complexity that would uh, – dictate that uh, we would, if it's complexity that would dictate that we should talk on the phone, I'm happy happy to do that too. So they can just email me, you, whatever, but I'm happy to do it. I love, I love this opportunity. This is incredible work. I hope to see, you know, everybody and more on the webinar in Cincinnati for the international meeting in July. And, you know, you said this is our fifth one. So, you know, when, when it's our 25th one and and I'm slowing down by then, uh, I'm still going to enjoy it. Yes, we're, we're going to have you come every year. It's guaranteed for sure. Okay, right. so do you want to throw up your uh, uh, your email up on there again at the bottom Absolutely. of the screen? I've got that here, fragilex at cchmc.org. And our staff check that and get things collated for me, and, and uh, I, I can respond. So, And then, uh, yeah, that that's really the best way. And, you know, folks, contact the foundation too and get it to me, but you just go direct that way, that's fine. And you can send it to me too and I can forward it to Dr. Erickson. Um, also, I know the question came up a couple of times because, um, just because we've talked about so many different medications, we will have this on a, um, uh, it, it, uh, we'll have a, a recording of this uh, available. So if you were registered for this, the recording will be sent to you automatically, and then we'll get it loaded onto our website uh, in the next week or so. So um, I just want to say thank you. Thank you, Dr. Erickson, for sharing your expertise with us. I mean, you are always, truly always, a wealth of information. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Hope to see you next summer, and really appreciate the opportunity. This is, uh, I want to let everyone know, this is the last webinar for this year. We'll start again in January 2018. And we have a webinar scheduled for almost every month next year, so be sure to watch your emails. Again, these webinars are made possible by your donations, so please consider making a donation at FragileX.org. And Dr. Erickson, any parting words? We're always hopeful. I think, you know, we're, we're looking at lots of new exciting treatment options and their efforts around the world from toddlerhood into adulthood and, 
you know, I, I think we're on the cusp of breaking out some, some new exciting trials across the United States and the country in the next year to 18 months. And we want to measure outcomes better. We want to personalize medicine in Fragile X. We're doing that here. Lots of our collaborators around the country are doing it. And we're exciting that, that we're truly still, you know, still very helpful. We're on the cusp of breakthroughs. Great. Um, what a hopeful way to end our webinar tonight. Again, thank you. So enjoy the rest of your fall. Have a wonderful holiday season, and we will see you next year. Don't forget, you can email me anytime with any question. Until then, this is Jane Dixon Weber. Have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Yeah.